Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Cube Pod, episode 64. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante here on Friday, extracting the signal from the noise. Dave, we just both were in Vegas for HPE Discover. We're back. It looks like we're through that the early season of events coming into the summer of love here for AI and certainly some time to take some time off. But uh, boy, woo, we just ran a marathon the past two and three months. It's been How many weeks did we have, John, with like three shows that we were doing live, like real live? I mean, no. it's, it's unbelievable. It's just, it's, it, you know, it's just the, the conference season analyst life analyst life is really, really about hitting the, all these events. Cause we get so much data and so it's worth every penny because we get to pull that back into the cube alumni cube research. Um, but we got a great, we got a great lineup today to talk about. We got to talk about certainly, um, there's some uh, podcasts with Trump on there. All in had po- Trump on there. Um, we got some news about HPE discover NVIDIA this week. Um, bust through as the most viable company topping Microsoft and Apple uh, dropped down a little bit, but still over tri- $3 trillion. Spectacular. Uh, a lot of stories there. And on our, on our last podcast, the comments on, on link on uh, YouTube pretty much say, can you talk about other people like Palantir? Although there was some uh, uh, contradiction comment, there was too much contradiction in the first 15 minutes that we were going to be bantered back and forth. So um the YouTube comments getting 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 pretty strong there. They want to talk about Palantir, which you have in the past today, right? You were talking about Palantir. So I didn't really know much about Palantir, but George talks about them all the time, and he's been educating me on them. They basically have built a semantic layer. You know, when we talk about the six data platform and you know Uber for all and all that stuff, but they've built uh, in to the system a way to har- harmonize all this disparate data. It's a closed system, but it's yeah. pretty kick ass. So. Um, and they're, you know, their CEOs, uh, he's on TV all the time. But so, yeah, we, we know Palantir, uh, and we, we use them as a model, for the next data platform, you know, as a, as a company that has done the, the work on the semantics, Salesforce is starting to yeah. do that as well. I would say Palantir, Salesforce, Salonis to a certain extent is another one. Enterprise web, you know, Dave DeGaul is another yeah. one that's doing that type of work, but the Palantir is pretty, pretty far advanced. I mean, what's really great about Palantir, we've been following from the beginning when I started Silicon Angle, even before that, this is a company that was founded by you know, Peter Thiel and it really got in from like a whole Stanford brain trust doing high-end government work, big data. Remember the big data craze when yeah. uh, Squirrel came out of the NSA? So during those early days of, of uh, NSA, the Snowden era, uh, and before that, Palantir was doing all that big data work. And so they mainly were on the down low because of all the contracts, but like you said, they're like Uber in the sense of they pioneered from scratch all this work, kind of like how Facebook did it for their company, these big hyperscales that build their stuff from scratch. So, you know, now they have uh, their own platform. So um, if folks want us to talk about Palantir, we're happy to get into it, but we got to get in there and get briefings from them and get more data. So if you're at Palantir, you're listening to the pod, you know, we definitely want to unpack what you got. And they're still winning contracts. It's a recent news is, you know, still winning big, big, Big government contracts. Their Federal stock government. is crazy. The stock like rockets up, then gets crushed, rockets up. You know who I, I, I forgot to tell you um, last week, you know who I saw at, uh, in Philly at AWS Reinforcers, Mark Terenzoni. It just reminded me with Squirrel. Remember Mark? He was yeah, CEO. I do. I do. Um, uh, Chris Lynch's company that they sold uh, to Amazon. And I was like, what's the story with Squirrel? You guys use that? You remember the, the you know, fine grain, granularity, all that stuff, that's gone. But they basically, I think, created a product. I think it's called Defender. I think Amazon Defender is actually Squirrel. Don't don't hold me to that. But anyway, there's some product that they they now use that's pretty yeah. Well, pretty the thing about the, the, what, the, you're, what you're getting at here is that the, that early big data world that we were, uh, when was, the Cube started 14 years ago, the high-end folks got most of the government contracts. That's where the, the market was. Everything else didn't happen. But if you look at what's happening right now, I just was talking to some of the VMware folks around the VCF and these big platforms that are emerging because they're basically a private cloud platform and get the whole scoop on the launch next week. Um, Amazon, VMware, now Broadcom, the big platform guys, Dave, they're dominating public sector business because the contracts, the military and private AI and all the AI data is really rewarding that. So you're seeing... um, non-standard kind of government contractors win business like VMware. I mean, VMware's always been in the public sector, but like when you have a platform like a Palantir, a VMware that's built to run holistically as a system, that's what the government wants, not one-off best-of-breed tools. 
and then they have to cobble together. They want they want the big enchilada. They want the big platform. So, you know, I'll tell you right now, that's that, that kind of validates the research we've been doing around clustered systems. And that's why we're seeing the OEM business from these VMwares of the world and, and NVIDIA is just dominating this AI message because the AI PC is just going to be a node in those big networks. And, and whoever runs the middleware and backend clouds run the table. So big, big part of why NVIDIA is so popular. So, you know, this NVIDIA stock price has so many storylines besides the, the low hanging fruit is, oh, they're the most valuable company and people are selling their stock. Is this, is this, is this a top of the top of the market? The bigger story is the, they're changing the platform shift and, and they're land grabbing in the enterprise of their OEMs. And so NVIDIA could actually be the model stack. And the HP event you illuminated that for me. So NVIDIA, you know, became the world's largest listed company Tuesday uh, because of their chips and their and their overall business growth. So and their systems, it's, and it's their clustered systems. I mean, you you you've been on this for a while, John. This clustered systems. Can we talk about VMware a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because there was a narrative at HPE. You know, the the back channels at HPE were the hey, we don't want to like, we don't want to like poke the bear, Broadcom bear, but you know, we have. You know, a lot of customers that are that are upset um mm -hmm. and you hear this in the, you know the narrative a lot of the the classic you know the 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 vm brown baggers <laughs> the v beers you know people are pissed right but here's what my, here's my narrative on this broadcom's doing exactly what they said they were going to do like back when they bought them and you know now they were buying them in 2022 hawk tan laid out the rationale and yeah. they basically said we're going to use the same playbook we're going to focus the company. We're going to narrow to the top customers. We're going to we're going to invest in R and D. Charlie Kawas, you know, explained this from the semiconductor standpoint in great detail on the cube at MWC and at the financial analyst meeting. We identify durable businesses with large install bases that we can invest in. We can lead the, the technology. We develop a roadmap. We focus, focus, focus. Cut the fat. They said yeah. exactly they were going to do that. So they're focusing on whatever the top. N companies. I forget what N is, John. You would yeah. maybe know. But basically, if I understand it, you you can add some color here. They did away with the ELA. The, the, the enterprise license agreement is like an all you can eat. They said, we're not doing that anymore. So now there's all these stranded licenses that people are going to have to pay for. And they said, we're no longer going to sell vSIN and NSX and all this stuff is separate. Component. We're going to have one SKU. Everything's simplified. They're obviously raising the prices and they're targeting the top customers in the pyramid. And they're saying everybody else, look, either you stay with us or leave us. We don't really care. We're going after the top customers. We're going to invest. So there's all these craplications, I call them, that may not need the full suite. Well, fine. So there's some options there. Yeah. So H HPE was basically saying, we'll help you identify your licenses. It's like you don't want to pay for, for instance, Oracle licenses that are orphaned or Salesforce licenses that are orphaned. It can get really expensive. So we'll help you find those and optimize that. And the second thing we'll help you do is, you know, with the private cloud and the green lake, we'll help you, you know, scale up, scale down, burst up, burst down, burn up, burn yeah. down, whatever. And third thing is for those crap locations, if you don't want to pay VMware, uh, because in Broadcom, because they're charging you too much, fine. We'll help you with, you know, HPE's got their own solution, virtualization solution, open, uh, uh, uh Red Hat, Nutanix. KVM, well, there's a lot Nutanix, of options. Nutanix there. earnings took a hit because they overpromised that they have all this business from VMware migrations, and they didn't. So if you look, if you squint through the the, the Nutanix earnings last earnings call, check that out. But Dave, I agree with you. I mean, first of all, VMware um, sit under Broadcom. A couple of observations and 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 things to report. Hawk Tan is very much um, a pragmatic person. He said he was going to do it. He's executing on that. However, in talking to insiders at VMware, and I've talked to probably over two dozen different executives and people within the realm of Octan and circles, they say he's he listens because I and and this is validated. I can I can prove this. I have data on this. He was going to kill the events and community. He listened and observed, changed his mind, and his quote was, "I'm the CEO. I'm allowed to change my mind." And and that's actually very not. Custom and most CEOs are very dogmatic. Oh, I thought I'd die on that hill. He actually operates that way, and he's very much convinced me. And I've, uh, the channel, same thing. Should this how we should do the channel? So, different people that I've talked to have convinced him 
of the value. Private AI, he wasn't too high on it, apparently, from what I heard. And Chris Wolf talked, had a long chat with them because they had baked that out years ago. Remember, they, they were the first ones to come out with private AI, and everyone's throwing tomatoes. Oh, that's bullshit. No, and it actually was right. Now everyone's talking about AI factories, AI private cloud, uh, HPE. So private cloud is a winning category. Gartner even even Apple's that. talking about private AI. So, so you know, Chris <laughs> Wolf, props to Chris Wolf over at VMware, now Broadcom. He he was the first one to go out on the limb. Two years ago, he brought it to Ragu. So, you know, you got to give credit. And by the way, it was first time publicly talked about on the queue. I think SuperCloud 4, we talked about private A over a year ago. So you know, VMware Cloud Foundation, VCF, they call it, is the core product. This is like the anch big enchilada. It's got everything in there. One license. All the goods are in there. And you could take that license in the cloud, by the way. They got rid of that so you, you can move that license into the AWS if you want to. So portability is addressed. They got a big announcement coming out next week. They're going to have all these new things revealed on 5.2 VCF. And again, VMware is basically building a cloud platform for the enterprise, off, on-prem, or edge. They want to be the AWS of private, meaning non-public cloud. So, and, they're, and, and they're very candid. Paul Turner told me, he's like, look at people love AWS for a variety of reasons, agile, higher level services, elastic compute and so, uh, services, great security, great security. And that's called, it's called the cloud. <laughs> and that's why it's good. What they don't like is workloads that are not optimized for the cloud and, or that are too expensive. That could be run on premise for things like confidential computing and now private AI. So I think the confluence of hybrid cloud becoming cloud operations with things like Kubernetes has changed the game where now the enterprises for the first time could have a cloud native environment on their own environment for security reasons, for privacy reasons, for private AI reasons, for confidential computing reasons, and then have that extensibility to the edge where VMware can manage all these services automatically under the covers like AWS does. So I think that's a compelling pitch. Now, so now that's only good day for about 500 to a thousand customers. Okay. Yeah, is that Morgan. the end? Is is that the number? I, I, I thought I, it was more I think, than that, I think it's I, about I'm, a thousand solid, yeah. big monster customers that'll never, okay. that, that love VCF. And then you got another, um, 5,000 to 10,000 other customers. And, and then you, when you're over the 10,000 mark, I think you're in talking about basically I run some vSphere. Okay. Those people are going to probably phase off the platform. VMware won't say this. They won't admit it. They won't comment on it. But, you know, I, I, the way I see it is if you don't want VCF platform, like a private cloud environment that as a, as a technology estate as part of cloud operations, distributed computing with AI and all that good stuff, then it's not a good fit. Yeah, guys and, running ESX, you know, or it's just like, hey, you know, I, but by the way, v, vSphere. if you're running, if you're using virtualization with vSphere, then you get the, the vSphere foundation product. You get the spring stuff with that too. So it's like there's like the, the I call that the mid-range. And then everything's then there's everything else. I don't, I don't VM, I think Broadcom's like, whatever, we don't want that business. And they're gonna focus on giving free support, free services. So that's that. And the second thing is, is that we'll hear this at VMware Explore. And then next week we'll see some news here, but mainly Explore will be the, the showcase, is their partner network. They've actually discontinued their partner connect program and revamped it under, I think, Broadcom Advantage. And that's going to be a big part of what you're going to hear um, next week. So um, SiliconANGLE is going to be live streaming that next week, a big event in our super studio. So look for that um, next week. A um, lot, of, lot of good information. So next, so, I think, the Wednesday, the 26th, we are streaming um, a live event. Chris, Chris is going to come in. Uh, Prasad, he's the general manager. We're going to hear all the updates, licensing, the new changes, 5.2. There's some serious nice nuggets in that. So again, I learned a lot, but let's just say cool. there's the VMware big companies and then VMware other. Okay, Everything so else. I got I got another data point. So at Discover, I talked to one of those. I think they would be in the top 1,000. There's a, it's a, I won't yeah. name the company. They asked me not to obviously divulge it but we had a very con uh, uh, candid conversation and I, uh, the individual i talked to wasn't the cio but it was a you know senior mid-level it manager it decision maker and this individual you know was upset they were, said we're pissed we're leaving we've got a five-year plan to leave vmware and it was like really 
I go, tell me, so tell me more about the applications they're running. And there are many app crap applications. Again, I call them, but then those will go. But then he's, we started talking about some of the core mission critical stuff, some of the database work they're doing. And I said, really, you're going to move off of VMware for that, are you? <laughs> and so, yes, we got a five-year plan. And I will, and I said to him, I predict you're, ne you're not going to get off that. Just like Amazon's still running Oracle, you're going to be running VMware five years from now. And if you, if, if you really think you're going to get off, off of that, you're going to probably do more damage to your company than you will have to pay a little, you know, a little bit more, even a lot more, uh, the, the cost to your business and the disruption to your business of that mig migrating those mission critical workloads, it's too risky. You know, my advice is really think, think long and hard before you do that. So I think Broadcom has a deep understanding of this. I think they've done the math. And like I said, they don't, they don't care about the crap applications. They want the, the, the loyal install base that, that they're going to invest in. And then the last thing I'll say is how cool would I, <laughs> basically VMware is becoming that gold standard for, for, you know, on-prem cloud. Who do you got? You got Oracle engineered systems, you know, Dell, imagine if Dell spun VMware in. They could have become the Oracle of infrastructure, but obviously they had <laughs> yeah. a lot of many billion reasons for Michael Dell not to do that. But anyway. Yeah, I think I think the idea of migrating to off VMware is a legit argument, but then you gotta look at the costs. And I was just um talking with um Rob Stretch and Q research team, and you and I talked about this briefly at uh, HPE. The cost of ownership conversation is complicated. Because remember, even last week we were debating. This is what came up in the YouTube comments about Snowflake versus Data. Is Amazon included in the TCO and apples to apples? Mm -hmm. That makes compared compared to like VMware migration and overall value of a VCF makes that look like a picnic. It's so complicated because the, the license costs alone. Okay, put that aside. What's the impact? Because if you have a true cloud native platform. Okay, and you right. go down that Uber like environment where you now have this ability to do things. The total cost of ownership equation completely radically changes because you factor in, okay, I'm automating Kubernetes. Now I'm saving money there. So you got efficiency and then top line revenue. Does the new infrastructure do that? So if you look at it from an IT only, I'm going to migrate. I don't want to pay that extortion fees, whatever their narrative is. The alternative cost is huge. Five years. Are you kidding me? Five years, the whole world could be different. Five years. I mean, how do you make decisions today about a five year migration? So it's a very difficult decision. The switching costs are not clear outside of the straight up license um, vibe. So if someone's pissed off, oh, VMware's jacking the prices up. If that's what they feel, then it's either real or perceived. If it's real, then they'll probably end up either switching. But that's the choice. If you really have to switch, it better be legit. <laughs> it might be more costly just on time, if not more. So you know, if I'm an enterprise CIO, I'm like, look, you better look at the numbers. Well, no, Floyer no. and I, uh, back in the day, we had a small little CIO consultancy. I can't tell you how many assessments we did where we were brought in on failed migrations, where they were trying to like do refuel the plane in midair. They were going down two parallel paths, trying to merge stacks, and they could never get there. And they would bring us in, and and, and we would advise them how to get out of it. And many, many times we would advise them not to do it because the business disruption, especially for the mission critical stuff, you know, the other stuff, the, the fringe stuff, who, you know, it doesn't matter, but the core, uh, applications, you just, mm, too many business processes tied to them. Well, I, I want to get your thoughts really on good. NVIDIA to change gears because this ties mm. in a little bit of, uh, the VMware, because remember VMware workloads have GPUs in them too. So. You know, G VCF yeah. has workload management in there with GPUs, but NVIDIA continued to be the, the world's most valuable company. Um, and it's capturing everyone's attention mainstream. I mean, it is, it is legitimately ca captured the imagination of mainstream. Everybody, no one's ever heard of NVIDIA in mainstream before, you know, this, this wave, they were just a graphics company doing chips. If you were a PC gamer, you knew them, but outside of that, you know, crypto enterprise, they were just, you know, who are they? Unbelievable growth. To, to think they just beat Apple and Amazon's yeah. in the rear view mirror on these guys. So it's really Microsoft and Apple and NVIDIA. And then the fall of Intel. And so it's just, it's just very, I mean, it's it's almost a supersonic ride. And will it survive? Rumor has it in Silicon Valley that everyone's selling their stock. 
then because they made so much money, dump it now. So they're, they're, they're rich. Uh, employees are making, making their bet and making their sales. So will that topple the company? Will their success be their failure? Uh, you know, sometimes success can cause problems. We'll see how they handle it. But I mean, I don't think there's going to be a problem, Mike, but you got to keep an eye on that. That's what some people yeah. are talking about. Yeah, there may be better entry points than where it is now, but you know, the problem with selling stock is a lot of times people don't buy it back. Personally, I mean, again, we're not giving investment advice. Don't listen to us. But, but I, if, if, if <laughs> my investment advice, if you own NVIDIA, would be to hold on. Yeah, no doubt. About <laughs> I, would, it. I would not be selling that <laughs> stock. I mean, Floyd and I did the, the analysis on the future of the, the silicon business. And we got, we actually have NVIDIA's growth and then in, from 23 to 28, the five year CAGR accelerating from its la last five years. I would I would not be a seller of Nvidia. No way. You know, you and I talked about. I forget which pod. It might have been in our first few podcasts. Now that we're on episode sixty four, but we we talked about when the recession was hitting, or we felt there was a recession coming. Um, startups were going to fall out of the sky unless they were Gen A. We were talking about this concept. Remember, we said the this is the first time in history where there's a recovery with hyperscalers. And if you look at the innovation with AI, what's the differentiation for startups? Okay, Rockset just got bought by OpenAI today. You've always said the rich get richer, the big get bigger. And, and so is there, the, the question is with NVIDIA doing the same thing, if they end up owning the model garden, or in this case, the NIMS, their NIMS, which is basically the, the, the model stack that they want to own, NVIDIA gets bigger. So the rich get richer, the big get bigger. Does that create like a, working class, you know, white collar, mid-range enterprise. It's like, uh, you know, the fifties, <laughs> you know, mm. you know uh, the, the middle, the, mid, and the, the, mid, the middle class, <laughs> the middle class emerged. Um, is there a startup tech middle class? Is it, um, is it going to be a, where there, there's a super rich and then just comfortable, I mean, lifestyle businesses, cash flow businesses. I mean, with AI, you, you're going to start to see people pop up now with these businesses that actually might not be super growth IPOs, but could get to 10 to 50 million in business or throw off a couple million dollars in profit for, say, an employee, small business that's got you know 30 employees um, doing you know 20 million a year. Um, so the, 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 the getting the, hollowed the, out. The, no, the predictions say no. It's going to fill in. It's going to be. It's going to be more. Um, millionaires and potentially there's more startups that won't make that classic IPO run. So the, it'll thin out at the top, get, get fat in the middle, meaning like the rise of the middle class in the fifties, you know, so post depression, remember the big rush was the middle class grew and, you know, people had suburban homes. And remember those days was our, our parents' generation, at least my parents' generation was, that was the case. So I think now it's startups just think about it. What differentiation does someone have with startup right now that the big guys can't do? It's a, yeah. it's a, it's a question. What's the okay, most? But, so that's interesting because, you, because the hyperscalers are saying are putting so much money into startups and you know, kind of controlling the table. I thought you were going somewhere else. I, I, when I look at the cloud, you take the hyperscalers, the big three U.S. hyperscalers who, you know, they are the richest. So the fat middle in, in the cloud era I would say was SaaS companies, you know, guys like Mongo and Workday. I mean, great companies, but, you know, not as valuable as the big hyperscalers. And so that was sort of the middle class, if you will. So my, my question is, is that where you, you, I thought that's where you were going. Like what's well, the I'm analog not, there the, today? The, the market cap of, of Mongo is 16 billion. That's not middle class. That's still up there. I'm talking about like, well, but yeah, but more, it's not a trillion. Right. We, we, I guess, I guess I'm missing your point though. You're saying that's most tech start. It, most tech startups weren't mom and pops. What I'm saying is going to be more, um, mo um, mom and pop like companies funded be, because, and, and profitable, but not going public because like, of AI. Yeah. Cause, cause AI gives them an advantage. Remember if you're yeah. creativity, it's domain expertise, it's augmentation. You move faster. And you and I talked about this. I think Cal Canis was saying about his podcast. Well, yeah, just you can do more. You don't have to hire a whole product team. It's not the 10X engineer. It's the 10X company. I mean, meaning you could do more with, with less people with AI. And so what, what the speculation now is, is that that's going to create 
an opportunity for this middle-class startup culture where it's not about going big or going home. It's like just getting in the game and making money and thinking about it from a cash flow perspective because AI will allow a creative entrepreneur to seize an opportunity, but the, they'll never be big enough at scale to compete with what Amazon because Amazon always tuck AI into their piece. Same with Google. So the question is, you know, at what point does the scale, the big scale foreclose opportunity for a startup? I mean, Mongo B, DB, you think they could launch a database company in these days? I think their stock's taking a hit, mainly because of the the AI world changed. I mean, they're down. If you look at look year to date, um, they were their high was five hundred two twenty seven. Well, they just had a shitty quarter, right? Well, and they guided it, they guided down. And well, it's, just, it's well if you connect the peaks there, it's a straight line down, dude. Like it's just if this continues, it's a straight drop off. And and if that if that if that means that the um, developer market's shifting, and their Atlas platform isn't aligned with say generative AI, all they have is vector search, that changes that what would developers do? Remember, neural network as Jensen was talking about is completely a different infrastructure. You know, it's it's. it's oh, I uh, think people people are questioning their SaaS models. They're they're like, wow, we spend all this money on SaaS. Salesforce, you know, Workday. I mean, ServiceNow is the one company that's just, they're kind of blowing away everything. And yeah. I don't know that's, if that's because they're so embedded into, and they saved IT's ass. They like IT heroes. Um, so I don't know. I, yeah. I, I, I do think the SaaS business could get disrupted. I, I think there's definitely, I think the pricing models will get disrupted. Um, I think there'll be new ways to, to, to solve productivity problems. And I definitely think organizations are, are going to, be holding off on some SaaS purchases and saying, Hey, can we do any of this with AI? What can we cut? What can we eliminate from our software estate? Cause this has been like incredible application portfolio sprawl and, and the CIOs left holding the bag, paying for all the infrastructure to support that when there's maybe like three people in the company using the app that they built, you know, five, seven, eight years ago, 10 years ago, yeah. and they haven't, they never retire stuff. So you know, it's IT, GRS, they never get rid of stuff. So, and then every 10 years, they go through an, a rationalization exercise. We saw this after Y2K when, remember Y2K, it was like an open checkbook during the dot com. Oh, yeah, spend, spend, spend. And then after Y2K, it was like, IT doesn't matter. Cut, cut, cut. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and then you saw it, you saw it as well in the financial crisis, but that was more of a cloud migration and then and then you saw another rationalization when people started going cloud native um and i think you'll probably see another one now because of because of ai it's like michael dell i think said you know it's a good good to have a big brainstorm every now and then cleans off the streets <laughs> well nvidia's rocking they got the land grab going on hpe they had a great deal of hp um they continue to surge well, let's talk about that the, i mean ev everybody's glomming on to nvidia right it's like no i'm i'm nvidia's best partner no i am <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> you you've been timing the uh the time that nvidia spends on stages which yeah. is very novel very smart uh you uh, were the I, first to do that <laughs> <laughs> it's like a sports car it's like hey how many times are on the track no i think i'd mean one antonio and them had a little bit banter back and forth so it looked took more time uh, but hp invested the time i thought hpe Hewlett Packard Enterprise had a has a significant bet, and Hewlett Packard Enterprise has to up their game. Nvidia's Nvidia's like IQ relative to the marketplace on this next wave is so ahead of everyone else's. Yeah. Um, they are Broadcom, Nvidia, because uh, they got the chips going, and all the chip folks that are on this edge. If I call Broadcom, Nvidia, AMD, uh, Sleebris, others, uh, Grok, they are so far ahead because they understand that the infrastructure is absolutely changing. And they're leading the way. And the OEMs like Dell and HPE and others, they're going to have to get online, and they are. But you know why? Because it's a refresh cycle coming on. Plus, clients going to have the requirements. But NVIDIA absolutely gets it. But but for HPE, they got to they got to up their game. And and, and Antonio Neri in his keynote said, "We're going to have everyone trained." He publicly was declaring that yeah. we're going to have to burn the boats here because it's. It's time, and it's a great move for NVIDIA and a great move for HP because it's a great partnership because NVIDIA gets the enterprise land grab with HPE because it's a joint sales, it's a joint go-to-market, it's just a killer deal, and it's, it's the biggest, better deal I've seen. It's better than Dell's, uh, in my opinion. So uh, I don't think Dell has a market development deal, a go-to-market deal with NVIDIA. So 
you know, everybody wants to be Nvidia's friend, of course. And uh, I think he stayed stayed on a little bit longer because it was the the sphere, John. I mean, that was a, kind of a cool vibe. But I think the you know the big question on everybody's mind is how big is their moat? How big is their runway? I, I talked to the Cube this week. I was kind of geeking out with Neil McDonald's segment. He didn't really want to go there because it, their HPE's emphasis is on systems and solutions, not on widgets. But I like to sort of dig in. Nvidia's Blackwell. Uh, have we talked about this? Nvidia's Blackwell is using the same TSM node as the previous generation, the current generation of Grace Hopper. Anyway, so it's the same process node, which is kind of interesting, right? Normally, you'd think they go to a new process node, but but TSM couldn't couldn't do it. They were too risky, so they said we're going to keep in the same node. The other thing is that Nvidia. Did we talk about this, John? Dialed down the floating point. Yes. Decision to did. four instead of eight. And so that saves energy. It gives them more real estate, allows the EDI, EDA guys to do more. The reason I bring this up is because when NVIDIA goes to the new node, that's another big advantage. And they're Ruben is probably the next node. And so they, they're on this one-year cadence, and they just keep, keep way ahead of the competition. I mean, it's impressive. I, I just don't see anybody in in their sites. I don't think AMD, AMD will get 10% of the market. Fine. Let them have it. Intel, you know, we've talked about Intel. If they pull this off, it'll be a miracle. So, I, I mean, NVIDIA has, I think, got five-year runway, at least, maybe more. Yeah, I think it's awesome. Well, I think it's a big deal. Uh, speaking of other uh, AI, OpenAI acquired Rockset, which is Jerry Chen's company from Greylock. He funded them. Ben Cat, great entrepreneur over there. Young guy. How proud of those guys. It's like to see them. Good company. Always like them. And then Open AI's founder, co-founder, resurfaced with a safe super intelligence. Uh, company's called Super Intelligence. And, and when I saw that, the first thing I said was Super Super Cloud, Super Intelligence, Super Cool. Um, that's gonna be interesting, Dave. It's, they're gonna pursue dedicated company to pursuing um artificial intelligence, um, super intelligence, AGI, and they're gonna want to get that fast. So uh, responsibly, he said. So that's going to probably get a boatload of funding. So you're starting to see that. And Anthropic just bumped up their um, benchmark. So they they have a new version of Claude came out. So that's news. Claude 3.5 raises the bar, hits all the benchmarks. So you're seeing the, the, the big, large language model leapfrogging everybody. So there's there's the whole consumer piece, AI, large language models, large foundation models happening. And then you have the long tail that we published with Power Law, uh, specialty models. And it's interesting to see how that's going on because you're starting to see use cases come into the Power Law. So again, I was talking to VMware's uh, 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 head of AI, and Chris was telling me that they have customer examples now coming in. And you saw Databricks lead with small language models and get that out there. So you start to see use cases where people are using big models and little models together. And remember at IBM Think, they had the Instruct Lab piece that came out of Red Hat. Again, we're starting to see the neural network infrastructure starting to roll out with now programmability around the data. So this is interesting. This is getting super interesting. And I, thought, I, think, I think ultimately every company will have their own neural network. Their neural network will be connecting with other networks. And you're going to see the fusion of networks happen in in the next 10 years this will be the new infrastructure and someone will write an operating system to tie it all together the question is will it be an open ai or for perplexity or someone else have no idea it may not be google it may be google google owns search since 1998 actually 2000 they had a 20 plus year run and can they keep it certainly perplexity is way better than google search okay perplexity is way better than open ai uh, at, at stuff that I've been using it for. OpenAI is better than Perplexity at certain other things, like helping write stuff, but Perplexity yeah. as a search engine is very strong. Oh, if you have a question, I agree. But but before we go there, I just wanted to comment on uh, your, your comment about um, models and benchmarks. I thought I thought Ali Goetze was pretty funny and self-deprecating when he was talking about DBRX, their large language model. And he was showing off benchmarks and he said, yeah, we were we were the top Top Gun for three days. You know, <laughs> thanks, Mark Zuckerberg, for announcing Llama 3. Same week we did. 
DVRX. And so that point being these yeah. things leapfrog each other. So by much, the way, he's really happy to promote that because it's open source. Remember, I mean, he's yeah, of course Llama three was open source. And again, Databricks is smart. They're, they're smart to bet on open source. But that's what I was going to say is he was, he was promoting the open source aspect aspect of it. But the other thing to your point of the power law is he also said, you know, at the end of the day, the customers we talked to, they don't care about the, the benchmarks. What they care about is what this is going to do for my business. And that's where you get into the, to the, to the smaller language models and the domain specific models in the, in the power law. Well, perplexity is getting a lot of bad press wired called it a bullshit machine. And other I read people, that article. They're scraping. Okay. They're scraping their site and bypassing robots.txt. Um, so um, it's pissing them off. Meanwhile, we're like, "Hey, come on, guys! If you're perplexing, take our feed. We'll give it to you. We love the product. We think real time news and analysis is killer." Again, I, I we said last time. We, I don't want to, you know, you know, fall over in love with perplexity again week after week. But last week we did, went. I went into great detail why I liked it. Uh, I like what they're doing. I think the user experience is phenomenal. Um, and I think it reminds me of the Google algorithmic search when it when Google became the obvious better search engine. So we'll see if they can continue it. But Verif Wired's pissed off because they were just getting their content scraped. But there's yeah, Wired's that, holding on to the they're like old school media. I got to hold on to the business model. I know. It's very sour grapes, uh, that article. Like, yeah, we, it's like, Guess what they did to us? They took yeah. our content without asking. I mean, I, 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 and there's no real case law on this, right? I mean, it's still kind of fuzzy, but um, I mean, I, I could see where they're coming from, but um, the problem I, with Wire, the problem with Wire, and people who think like that are realizing that they haven't realized yet that they're already dead, okay, and that they don't know it yet, and they have to change. Their, they have to adopt. This is going to be a discovery layer. They should work with the think about how to work with perplexity and preserve their great business model. Wire is a good publication. I hate to see them fall into irrelevance by getting stuck on a business model too long that we know is outdated and antiquated. So, you know, Wire it's good. Their articles are good, but you know, to, to throw rocks at perplexity, what are they trying to do? Shake them down for some cash? All perplexity has to do is say, oh, we'll give you some cash. Facebook did this, suckered the entire media business for a decade. Yeah. Okay. And ended up killing them. And then by the time we should have got more money. At least Apple gives some revenue share back, and then but they're still strip mining media. Media is getting fleeced by the big platforms. So you either embrace it or and extend, or fight it and die and get some guilt cash thrown your way. I mean that's what Facebook did. They threw you know guilt money at people. Oh yeah, I will pay you. But they already killed journalism. Facebook killed journalism. That's why um, you know a lot of these companies went out of business. I mean look at look at the BuzzFeed. And it's well documented for the folks. Ben, Ben, who's the founder of Semaphore, um, uh, is uh, tons of experience covering this story. Um, he covers media really well, and he nailed it. BuzzFeed just they got suckered, and then they zigged, and they should have zagged. They would went all in on video. Axios, it's another one. Axios is in formats beautiful. It's short. It's real. It's uh, it's short. It's descriptive. But guess what? AI could do that, right? So. You know, Axios could be replicated. So I'd be nervous too. Forbes general counsel sent a letter to Perplexity demanding they remove misleading articles and re repay Forbes for advertising revenue earned from its alleged copyright infringement. This is Forbes that has a, this is who makes their money on contributor posts, paid posts, and has a paywall. So, you know, I, I hate to say it, but mm, I won't say it. You know what I was going to say. <laughs> well, yeah, I do. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and what did George Gilbert say? He, he wanted to eat his hat. I, I, I don't think I'll eat my hat by saying that the um, traditional media is uh, digital media is going to pretty much die. So if they don't adjust to the distribution of neural networks, uh, and 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 that's changing. I don't think they even can understand what that means. To be honest with you, Dave, it's just like. I mean, well, they got a business. They're hanging on to it. They're trying to protect the past from the future. You can't really blame them. But run, run their events. You know, you get your events, your paid content, and you know, but people are going to discover information differently. You know, AI is going to automate discovery. Friends will, you know, for referral traffic will probably move from search away from other, to other mechanisms. So we'll see. I mean, again, we're we're we have nothing to lose. We are on the right side of this one, in my mind. We got great great distribution through the AI systems. And SiliconANGLE gets a ton of great referrals because of the quality of the content. 
I've been seeing some really great numbers lately on the site. On SiliconANGLE? Yeah. It's awesome. Yeah. Incredible. What are we well, tracking? If you, to, if you go to Perplexity, it's picking up all of our posts for the event. What are you we know, tracking now? Can you say? Um, are we at a million a month yet? We're over a million a month. I think this month so far, we're at like 850, 850,000. Okay, so it's almost a million. That's good. Yeah. I mean, look, but yeah, but we're not in any of the big engines. That's just direct traffic. So all good. Well, well, I, I just I just got Fitzy's newsletter this week. It's, he's great. It's so good. What's he got <laughs> going on there? He just hammers Apple, um, hammers open AI. Um he, he hammers IBM. IBM he says IBM. He's so brutal. He's IBM's not a technology company, McDonald's edition. I guess the, there was some failed McDonald's thing, drive through thing. Yeah. Because, you know, IBM's doing these really hard solving these really hard problems. So they don't always work when it comes I, out. Yeah, he or takes a lot of it's easy to take cheap shots at IBM. From that's what his he does. Standpoint but his best his best cheap shot. Ex. His best cheap shot is Oracle invents non gap capex. So it's, <laughs> it's like Oracle's at an all time high, and, and uh, you know, they're not Microsoft, but uh, they're a pretty good company. But his stuff is funny, it's just all so tongue in cheek. Um, he, he's that you can tell where his biases are. He actually, um, because well, he used a, to work at Microsoft, he's, he's right? a complete so, Microsoft, big, 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 big time, totally, um, totally very clear. All right, Dave. The other news is is that um, you know we saw, and I don't know if you caught this, but Antonio Neri brought this up. A UK antitrust watchdog opened up a probe against HPE um, in the UK for its like, Juniper acquisition. Um, and you and so, he brought that up in our interview. Antonio Neri is the CEO of HPE. Um, that was interesting. You think that's going to fly? I don't. I don't see any problems with Juniper, and I don't see any problems with Juniper and uh, and HPE. You would think that it's a no brainer. I mean, they're, they're Cisco is the dominant player, has more than half of the market. Why wouldn't you, you know, allow that? But you never know these days. It's like the EU comp the the UK Competition Committee. Oftentimes, is a is a surrogate for Lena Khan's dirty work, as we know. They never. There's no acquisition that they seem to like. They want to just kill every all M and A. Uh, they want to kill crypto. Right? There's no IPO market. There's there's no M and A. You know they're trying to kill alternative digital currencies. It's like so regressive. I just don't get it. Well, yeah. a lot of good action going on in the industry. So we got the um, super cloud coming up. We got the summer times here. Um, VMware Explorer events coming up. That's going to be the next big one. We got a bunch of other events. I'll be in. Uh, uh, looks like New York for New York City, which for AWS event. Um, New York Summit. We'll look for that one. And uh, just in general, Dave, just going to be a lot of in-studio, super studio action this this summer. And I and I got to say, you're seeing a lot more of the companies transforming their business with sales enablement into vi from video. So, you know, we're yeah. seeing a lot more content coming in. Um, the Cube AI is getting more neural networking. It's getting more more stronger on the results. Check out the CubeAI.com. The CubeAI.com is where our neural network exists. That's our retrieval. RAG system, retrieval augmentation generation, we've been doing for over a year now. Uh, all of our content at SiliconANGLE Media and the Cube Research is now uh, in neural network form. It can be queried and searched, and you're going to make a lot more personalization. Check it out. We have that neural network building building out and adding more every day. So um, if you're interested, ping me or Dave. Happy to tell more about that. Um, and in general, told me the other day that RAG is dead. I think Sanjeev Mohan is going to write the piece that RAG is dead. Like I don't think so. Rags, Rags already outdated. Come on, it's like, no. I think I Rags, know, it I might not be Sanji, but that's not it's fair. Definitely, it's definitely it's not not true. Not true. Maybe it's Tony Bear. It, I it, no, I, I, Rag is not dead. Rag will always be a feature. The question is, will Rag be um, categorically funding startups? Or will because it be useful. Look at we look at Dave. We've seen this movie before. Not to go on a little rant, mini rant here, but we've seen the movie before. The internet was classic. Everything to me, that's best. The best analogy so far is the internet and web. There were so many early companies that were features, not companies. And that's what's happening now. RAG is a feature of the system, not yep. a company. Yeah, there's some lang chain orchestration stuff going on, vector databases, but ultimately a neural network's math, a series of content ported into math, either language or images into, into math numbers. 
And the vectors allow you to get massive search aperture and great, great results through the matching of the, of the math, mathematical formulas. That's the benefit of the neural network. So what that means is you can have neural pathways or content pathways, retrieval pathways. So I think RAG only accelerates, if not well, doubles I think, yeah, and triples. I, I, think, I think RAG will get, yeah, RAG will get more it, 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 more it, multi, multimodal. Multimodal yeah. prompt engineering will be built in via one query. It'll have some intelligence around reasoning prompts. They'll probably get, will it get agentic? Will it be able to take action? I mean, I think people, I think, that, so. I, think, I think it's when you have reinforced learning right now, it's like it's training and inference. I think what Jensen talked about at GTC that got, didn't get, it got overlooked a lot, but he, he definitely said it certainly in our one-on-ones he, we, with us, he did reinforced learning will be a really big part of this. The reasoning yeah. and the intelligence comes from that piece. So right now all the, the markets on training and then moving quickly to inference inference will be certainly great. But reinforced learning will allow things to get smarter. So, for example, today you go out a query like perplexity in ChatGPT, you type a prompt. You might not have to do that anymore. ChatGPT already has learning mode where you can keep that thread alive and it kind of keeps memory. So that notion of memory, you're in the same thread. Perplexity is doing the same thing. Ask a follow-up question. It's getting smarter. That's where the action will be. That will, that will kill the rag front end, but ultimately make that programmable. So, again, I'm a big believer that's only going to get bigger. Uh, Jensen seems very sanguine about inferencing, and everybody says, "Oh, Nvidia's going to get smoked on inferencing. They're too big. You don't need that big of GPUs." And when you when you listen to Jensen, he's like, "Oh no, the real opportunity in, in inferencing, and forty percent of our data center revenues are inferencing." So I think he's got real I, designs and plans on dominating that market too. We'll see. I mean, I know I, guys I think, like Rock I think yeah, I, I, I agree. I, I think you're right, Dave. Uh, inferencing is standard. That's he's never so gonna far ahead of everybody's thinking, and he's doing so much. They're so advanced in their research and development and their roadmaps. I mean, they, they've got, I think they've got plans there. So we'll see. I mean, they're but, way ahead on ARM. They've been on ARM for a long, long time. So, guys, check out our business business uh, conversations with the VCF next week. Dave, it's summertime. You're in a red eye. I don't know how you do it. Pull the red eye. You got the plug in your ear up right now for the fire alarm, which can't, we can't hear. You can't believe how loud it okay. is here. I can't believe you guys can't hear it. My, I can't take my finger out of my ear. I'll go deaf. I got to pull I, the fire alarm. We'll let you go. We'll end it here. Go. We're about All an right. hour. Episode 64. Thanks, go to siliconangle.com, thecube.net, thecubeai.com, thecuberesearch.com. We got it all there. Bringing all those insights in there. We got the neural network up and running. We're going to keep adding to the content. Let us know in the comments what you want to hear about. We, got, we talked about Palantir today based on the comments. So we'll, we'll look at those and uh, give us a shout out. All right. Thanks for listening, Dave. See you next time. See you guys.